It is, uh, it's good to have you here. I'm so glad. How many of you are New Year's resolutions type people? Nobody? One, two, three, four. All right. I'm not going to call out whether you kept your New Year's resolution or not. Uh, it's only been, what, five days in. Uh, I was talking to Paul, who, uh, Paul is one of our people at our church, and uh, he got a new membership to um, the fun flex and he was running and doing all kinds of stuff and then he came home and he started feeling bad and he had this minor heart attack and so Paul now has had a stint put in and he's recovering and we I went to the hospital last night to visit him and to say hi and to pray for him and Mary and he goes well that's what you get for getting a new uh, a new workout plan you know for a resolution in that and I thought well they shouldn't all end that way but you know I think um, as a people, we tend to be a people that set goals, right? I mean, uh, there's a Greek word we're going to talk about today, but the word is teleos, and it is a goal-setting mindset. We are a people that, um, in order for us to think about the future, in order to not get stuck in the present, we teleos, we think about what's ahead and where the goal is. And that word also means mature. It means to grow up in your faith. And so um, I thought with the book of James that we would talk about in the next couple weeks, in the next few months, actually, we're going to look at what maturity looks like according to God's ideas, according to uh, Jesus' stepbrother, James, and really look at what that all means. And so um, what I thought I would do, though, is kind of kick off our, our new year with a reminder of our purpose as a church. Who we are as Crossroads. Uh, In fact, the name Crossroads comes from the idea uh, in Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 16. The verse reads like this. You stand at a crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it, and you will find rest for your souls. I think today, in this age, we have a lot of people that are asking a whole lot of questions and asking for a whole lot of direction. There are generations that continue to be born that are uh, generations of people who try to find truth and direction from all sorts of different places. In fact, there are state laws that are being passed for you to consume some new drug and for you to kind of feel as though you can seek your own path. But for me as a believer, for us as a church, is to go back to the ancient path, to go back and see what God has done, and at that crossroads... We make a decision whether we're going to walk with God on the the holy path or we're going to walk on our own. And that's what maturity actually looks like. In fact, all of us need to come to answer that question. Here's the big idea for today. There's There's a big idea that I try to launch every time I preach, and this is the idea. Eventually, everyone stands at a crossroads in life. One way or another, you must answer the question that Jesus is asking, Who do you say that I am? All of us must face a moment where we find out who Jesus is and either accept that and walk with him or reject it and turn away and try that for a while. My hope is that if you're visiting or new or you haven't heard these truths, that you would say, I want to put my life and trust into who God is because he never changes. In fact, the scripture that that idea comes from where Jesus says, who do you say that I am, comes out of the book of Mark chapter 8. Verse 27 through 29, and Jesus and his disciples went to the village around Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked them, who do people say that I am? And they replied, well, some say that you're John the Baptist, and others say that you're Elijah, and still others say you're one of the prophets. You see, John the Baptist and Elijah were killed, or Elijah went away, but they would see that a new prophet would come, and some are saying that you're just a a prophet. And then Jesus says, but who do you say that I am? That's the most important question in the Bible. And Peter said, well, you're the Messiah. You're the truth teller. You're God in the flesh. You're the one that is God's presence with us. And uh, so what I thought it would do is tell you that that's why we exist today. That's why we exist as a church is we stand at a crossroads and we say, we declare who Jesus is. And we say, Jesus is our Lord, our Messiah, the God that we worship. When we worship and sing songs up here, we're not just singing. We're worshiping the God of the universe who sent his son, Jesus, that we might have life and have it to the full and live a life different than the rest of the world. And our calling is to serve our community. 
to not just think about ourselves and to be totally self-absorbed, but to think of our community and how we serve others and how we live a life that blesses other people. So in return, God blesses us. It's a, it's a work together kind of mentality. See, this morning we're going to forge ahead in this idea of growing in our faith. I love this book of James. I love the fact that uh, Jesus' half-brother or stepbrother wrote it. And it gets us to the place of how do we grow up in our faith? In fact, today's title is called The Marks of a Mature Person. How do you actually grow and learn some marks? I'm going to ask you five questions today and see if they relate to you and your mark of maturity and where you are in your faith. Because I think for all of us, we want to grow up. At least that's what I believe about my kids. When I have two kids, and uh, I can't tell you how much joy that I get watching them grow up. Any of you parents out there, you absolutely know that when your kid succeeds, when your teenager grows and succeeds, when they do great things, you take incredible pride and joy in the fact that they're growing, right? I mean, none of us as parents want our kid to be diminished, want our kid to, to not make it or to be humiliated or to fail or to fall or to, right? We want the best for our kids. That's how it is in my life. My son's learning to drive and my favorite thing is to sit, wow, to sit next to him and to watch him control the car and to watch him grow and to see that he has perception to see that he can see what other cars are doing, to actually see his life mature. I'm like, wow, I me mean, was three years old just a year ago, right? Now he's almost 16 and he's driving my car around. I mean, I have incredible joy with that. And with my daughter on the swim team and what she does in her middle school and how she's learning how to do things in school, I just, I have such pride. And I think all of you do as parents, you watch your kid grow up. We all just spent the holidays and we were able to see our children grow and learn and, and receive. And just the greatest thing is to see them grow. You know that God feels the same way about us. God doesn't just stand in heaven with this long white duck dynasty beard and look down at us and point his finger and say, look, you blew it again. You're wrong. You failed. You shouldn't say that. God doesn't do that. God loves us like we love our children. And for those of you teenagers and kids out there that don't have kids yet, you'll see one day that you, your life will be more and more fulfilled as you recognize how God parents us, wants us to grow in our maturity. In fact, as we look at the word maturity, we look at uh, really what does it mean to grow up, right? And uh, I, I figured maybe a good way to start would be to look at maybe three things that maturity is not. Have you ever done that? Have you ever wanted the definition for something and the best way to define it is to look at what it is not? So here's three words that, that maturity is not. One of them would be it's not automatic. Maturity doesn't just happen automatically in your life. I know so many Christian believers that have accepted Christ in their life and they're They've been walking with God for 30, 40, 50 years, and they're not very mature. Do you know what I mean? I mean, they know all the right answers, but they're not necessarily mature in their life. And uh, I, I've actually seen a bumper sticker that says, I may be getting older, but I refuse to grow up. You ever seen that? Uh, what I call that is the Peter Pan syndrome. You know, the whole story of Peter Pan is this great story with Wendy and the, the siblings and they go off to Neverland and all this stuff. You know what the real story is about? About people not growing up. Peter Pan never matured in his life and he wanted to stay this kid and have this little island and just kind of escape the reality of life. Well, we're not Peter Pan. We can't just escape life. And the thing is, it's not an automatic maturity. It's it's like riding a bike, you're either moving forward or when you stop. And have you ever had clip-in pedals with clip-in shoes on your... I have a mountain bike and I have these clip-in shoes and I'm going up a hill and when I stop and I can't get my feet out of the pedals, I fall over. In fact, one time I was ascending this hill so steep that I tumbled backwards. I couldn't get my feet out and my front tire hooked onto this tree branch that was right there low and I was hanging upside down. My feet were in these pedals. I was clipped in and I'm going... Oh man, I can't even reach my phone. And I was totally, I had to wiggle my feet out. You're either moving forward or you're falling off. 
The Christian life is about us to grow and move forward, but it's not automatic. The other thing it's not is, it's not appearance. It's not the way you look mature. It's not what you wear and, you know, like priests and, and bishops and rabbis, and I even have one. It's, I have a, uh, a uh, robe and a stole that I wear for weddings. It's a minister kind of outfit. When I put that on, I'm no more holy. I'm no more like, like my appearance doesn't make me more mature, right? I mean, you could dress up for the finest outfit, the finest meal, the finest play, and you could be no more mature than anybody else. It's this sort of appearances don't make you mature. Here's the other thing that, appear, that uh, maturity is not. It's not academic. It's not necessarily all the things that you know. Do you know that? Ironically, you know, you go to high school and you think, man, when I go to college, then I'll be smart. Right? And then you go to college. And you're like, man, I'm smarter than anybody else here. And then, oh, if I just go to grad school, if I just get another degree, well, you end up finding out how much you don't know with all these professors who know all this stuff. And you think, I don't know what I should be knowing. And you realize that it's not about academics. Do you know also... You can learn the Bible so profoundly deep. You can memorize every word. And that can also not bring you maturity. Just knowing stuff doesn't make you mature. In fact, James even says it. He says, faith uh, is more than knowing the Bible. It's doing what the Bible says. If you just read the Bible and you turn away and you don't do it, it's like looking at your face in a mirror and then forgetting what you look like when you walk away. So maturity is not those three things. But um, we should find out what maturity actually means. So according to the Bible, maturity is actually the process of becoming more like Jesus Christ. If we were to wrap this whole book up into a phrase, it would be the process of becoming more like Jesus. (laughs) Is it easy? No. No. Is it fulfilling? Yes. Is it God filling you, becoming like Christ, and and helping you grow in your faith? Yes. That's what we're going to talk about. And there's a trick to it. There's a key to this entire book. I could stand here all day and tell you that maturity is about how much you learn, and how much you know, and how much you grow and persevere. We're going to talk about a bunch of different things. But really the key is the power of God with you that changes you from the inside out. See, as a believer, it's easy to go, well, if I just work harder, then God will be more happy with me and I'll grow in my faith and I'll have this opportunity to become way more mature. It's not about working harder. It's about trusting that the power of God within you is at work and he slowly is working to grow your faith. It's about the power of of God in you. And if you're sitting here this morning and you uh, don't have God in your life, you don't have a relationship with God personally, then you're lacking the power to let God do his work in you. And therefore, lacking the power makes you think that the more you work in religion, the harder you do the right things, then you'll be a better person. That's the whole misnomer right there. It's not about how much you do. It's about trusting the power of God in you. And letting that power of God work in you. It's the key to all of life. And the thing is, it changes us from the inside out. It's not about, okay, I've got to get all these things right and situated. It's about the inside, God working you from the inside to the outside. But here's the problem. It is slow. It's a slow growth process. I mean, it's like my, asking my 16-year-old son to you know, drive across country on his own. Or to take a, a, a big truck and drive a truck to Florida and make sure you deliver all these goods. You can't ask a person who's not mature enough to do something way too more mature. Does that make sense? Maybe I didn't say that correctly. But God allows us to walk in this slow process. The other day I was at the grocery store and I watched this father and son in front of me. And uh, we were going toward the checkout line. And the dad looked like he was in this incredible hurry. Come on, come on, hurry up. we got to get, get home. we got to do this thing. And whatever he was saying, I was kind of watching his impatience. You know what I mean? And the kid was more of a grazer, if you will. The kid's like standing around, looking at all the candy on the shelf and 
kind of, you know, playing with stuff and just looking around. You know, like five, ten feet behind, the dad's already up, going to, you know, toward the checkout, and the kid is just slowly lagging, and the dad's like, come on, we gotta go, I gotta, and they get into this cash only, like this, the checkout line where you're supposed to have ten items or less, and the cash, and the guy in front of him had a credit card, and I saw the guy just get irate, just, just start to lose it, get super mad, Oh, I can't believe this. We're in a hurry. We have to. And he's getting impatient. And his son looks up at him and goes, Dad, it's okay. I, now I can have more time with you. Oh. I was just like, oh. Was kind of watching that. And I thought, you know, that's how it is with, with me and God sometimes. I'm in such a hurry. I, I have to get something accomplished so fast. And then God says, yeah, but now we have more time together. Now you actually are paying attention to me, so we can actually have some, I wish I could learn those lessons quicker. Do you know what I mean? And God's like, wait a minute, it's a slow, slow process. Or maybe if, if it's not slow enough, maybe you sometimes feel like you're going the wrong direction. Have you ever felt like that? Like this picture of this feet with these arrows? It's like... God wants us moving in this direction, and you feel like I'm not even moving, let alone am I going in that right direction that God wants for me. Maybe I'm headed over here. And God says, I want you to grow. I want you to move in my direction and move with the power of God in you. God wants us moving in the right direction. So what I said is the Greek word is teleos. It's five times in the book of James. And... Uh, what James is saying is we are goal-setting people. We are a people that learn about maturity and learn how to grow. And in a way, it's a lot like blueprints. It's a lot like a map where you unroll the blueprints and you look at uh, what you need to build. How many of you builders are out there that actually look at blueprints or you look at a city plan or you look at things that you need to pay attention to and you got to get the specs right? you got to do the right thing in order to have the right product. Well, James is like unrolling these blueprints of maturity so that we can all move in that right direction. So I want to give a quick overview of what the book of James is about today, and we'll tackle it next week. We'll dive right into chapter 1. Uh, but I want you to ask yourself five questions today. The first question is this. Am I becoming more able to endure under pressure? If you want to write that down, I'll give you a minute. Am I able to endure under pressure? You know that pressure is that thing that where all these circumstances collide at the same time and you feel like life is happening too fast or it's too hard or too whatever, fill in the blank. Are you able to see God's hand in it? Are you able to uh, not just resist the pressure but use the pressure and move forward? It's kind of like all these quarterbacks you're watching in the playoffs right now. They're receiving incredible pressure from the other line. And they have to uh, move around in the pocket. They have to do well. They have to pass right or run correctly or whatever it is, right? I mean, that's what pressure in life feels like. Here's the verse in James that talks about it. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds. It doesn't say if, does it? It says when. Because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. And perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Next time God gives you an opportunity to grow, ask yourself the question, am I becoming more mature in this, more complete in this, or is this a waste of my time? Is this killing me? I want to avoid it at all costs. God's saying, I actually want you to grow. It's an opportunity. Perseverance is endurance to stand in the pressure when pressure is applied. Um, when I was in seminary, we had this class. Believe it or not, I got to take this elective class called Boundary Waters. It was called Faith in Wilderness. And a bunch of us, 10 of us, went to northern Minnesota up by Canada in the Boundary Waters between the two. And we took canoes and kayaks and we went on this four-day uh, traverse across all these lakes. You would paddle across lakes, you'd walk, you'd pick up your canoe and your kayak, flip it over, and you'd walk, you know, a couple hundred yards, you put your canoe back in, you get into another lake, you traverse that. It was an incredible class. I got credit for that. It was so great. And we got to see God at work in creation, all these things that we studied. But here's the hard thing. We didn't predict the weather. We get out on the middle of this giant lake in Minnesota. You know Minnesota has giant lakes. We get out on this lake. It felt like four degrees. 
and there were white caps on the water, and the wind was blowing incredible. And so we, we all partnered up, and me and Mark, we get in this canoe, and we're paddling, and we're trying to go into the wind and cut through the wind because our destination's over there. But my other two friends, um, Caroline and Jeff, they get in this kayak, and the thing is they started drifting with the wind, and they got totally blown off course. And our professor says, well, hey, we've got four days of this. You can't just quit. We can't turn around. That was pressure. I mean, it was great. The trip ended awesome. But it was this pressure to either go into the wind or get blown off course. And I'll tell you what, there's nothing like a trip like that where you learn each other's attitude. You learn how people support each other or push each other away or how we build each other up or how we knock each other down. And I think trials are like that. When you're in a trial, do you find yourself griping and groaning and moaning? Or do you find yourself trying to ask God, okay, God, what do you have in this? Uh, am I becoming more affirmative and then more gracious in this? Or, God, is this all your problem or is this, hey, is this an opportunity for me? What kind of question do you ask yourself? Do you find yourself being blown off course or do you actually say, okay, with perseverance I'm going to grow through this? Here's another question you could ask yourself. Am I becoming more sensitive to people around me? Do I become sensitive to the needs of people that are around me? Am I growing in my faith enough where I actually take notice of what other people feel? Here's the verse for that. James chapter 2 says this. If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing right. You know what James is doing here? He's basically saying, my brother got it right. Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. But is, and if you're doing that, then you're doing the right thing. You're growing in your faith. I love that. And we can see that James is working with a community here that had a real issue of uh, snubbing the poor, if you will. He was writing this letter to people who had, uh, uh, they were taking advantage of the poor. They were making them work. And they were snubbing the poor. And James is saying, are you actually paying attention to their needs? The one question you could ask yourself is, as a mature person, am I being sensitive to the needs and the hurts of others? You know what I would love for us at Crossroads is to call ourselves others-centered or other-centered, where we put other people's needs before our own. We actually listen and care, and we find out that, that we're not just the church when we gather here. I mean, this is great and all. But actually, we're being the church when we're outside of these walls, when we're being and living and doing the things God calls us to do in the community where we're at and serving other people, having them reflect, uh, having us reflect the light of God so they see God in us. That's my goal. Um, I, uh, I was a youth pastor for 20-some years before I was able to be called here, and I remember the power of encouragement. I remember going to camp one time, and we had a counselor who was kind of green. She didn't really, you know, have all the best words and all the best sort of uh, ways to, to, you know, kind of do the right thing or say the right thing in the moment. But I'll tell you what, she had the gift of encouragement. And if you ever want to see somebody else grow in their faith, work with students and children and, and be there at that moment in time where they need that encouragement and that blessing. I'll never forget this moment where... Uh, this counselor talked to me afterwards and she said, I can't believe I got to go to camp. I can't believe that I was able to have these girls and counsel them and all this. And I said, why? I mean, it, it, was, it was neat, wasn't it? She was, yeah, but I think I saved a girl's life. And I said, what do you mean? And she said, well, when Julie talked to me, she said she wanted to commit suicide when she went home from camp. And I was just able to listen to her and encourage her and to bless her. And I think God put her at the right place and the right time, this counselor was sensitive to the needs around her, and she was able to be blessed. It's not just, okay, I'll give, I'll give everybody else priority. It's, I'm going to give them an, an ear. I'm going to let them have my heart so that when I can bless them, God is blessing through me. So that's a question. Are you being sensitive to others' needs? Here's a third question. Am I being more able to manage my mouth? I know. This one's hard. James nails it in chapter 3. He just absolutely nails it. But the question is, can you manage your mouth? He says this, We all stumble in many ways, and if anyone is never at fault in what they say, they are perfect, or we would say complete or mature, able to keep their whole body in check. 
we all stumble, we all fall, but the more we can manage our mouth and bless others rather than curse and lift them up, then we're able to grow in our maturity. See, I've talked to so many people that just say, well, I just say it like it is. I don't really care what people think. I just tell it like it is, and if it's in my head, it comes right out. You know those people? We would call that frankness or being being frank or just being just... We call it rude, to be honest. <laughs> but James calls it immature. James says, you're a person, if you are rude, then you are immature in your faith. You're not growing up in Christ and letting God's words be blessing to others. Remember the canoe and the kayak story I was telling you about? You know what happened with this couple that they, they kind of drifted off place? We found out they didn't put the rudder in their kayak in the correct position. So they had no rudder that was determining their direction. You know, James talks about that too. James actually says that like a little rudder, your tongue controls what you say. And you, you can control an entire ship with a small rudder. In the same way, your entire language, your entire course of life is controlled with your little tongue, the muscle. I, uh... I went to the dentist, I had a root canal a couple weeks ago, and I was kind of thinking about my tongue in the chair. I was like, it's kind of weird, because the doctor has to like put on these gloves and like move your tongue, and you know, and I'm like, does your tongue ever get kind of in the way of all the dentistry? And they go, you should see from our perspective. You think it's weird sitting in the chair, it is a little monster, that little tongue. And, like, and you can't control it. The person in the chair can't get because half of your face is numb. You can't feel anything. Your ears are tingling right from the Novocaine. And then your tongue is like, and they're like, can you move your tongue? Can you, sw you swallow? Could you? And they're always like, that's in the way. And I was just thinking about how James talks about the tongue. It is an out-of-control beast. And what's so funny is we have an opportunity to control that, to learn to mature in that. Here's a couple more, and we'll finish up. Number four, am I becoming more of a peacemaker in times of conflict? Am I becoming more of a peacemaker when there is conflict? I, uh, I think of James chapter 4. He says, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Do they come from your, or don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You know that we have battles, we have these conflicts that arise all the time, and we can either be a minister of peace or a person that continues to raise trouble. In fact, that's the one of the words that James uses in there is a troublemaker. A troublemaker is a person that likes to cause trouble, that likes to throw gravel on the pathway, that likes to throw marbles on the path and make you trip and stumble. Do you know some troublemakers in your life? And, and the question is, am I a troublemaker? Ask yourself, do I cause more conflict or do I raise up more peace? You know, the idea that James talks about is when you see maturity in your life, you'll notice that there will be uh, less conflict in your life, a lack of contention, because you're able to minister with peace and care for people. It doesn't mean trouble isn't going to come or conflict won't come, it's that you'll be able to, to manage it and care for it in a way that God allows us to bring peace. Here's the final question this morning. Am I becoming more patient and prayerful under trials? Am I becoming more patient and prayerful under trials? That's a really hard question. Because when trials come, if you're like me, you want to solve it real fast and move forward. You don't want to be patient and wait. And then pray about it. You think, oh, okay, God, you, you know this is here. Just get this out of my life. God says, wait, I'm actually trying to grow your faith. Remember? James chapter 5 says this, Be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. That's a long time. God is coming. But he wants us to be a patient people. And then he ends in chapter 5, verse 16. The prayer of a righteous person is what? Powerful and effective. When we pray and we grow in our patience, God works in us. You know what's incredible is that God uses those two things together. Prayer and patience. God works them together. And it happens in our life when we're stuck in a holding pattern. 
How many of you have been in a holding pattern in your life? You ask God for something and it doesn't come. Yeah. On Friday night, my wife and kids and I traveled back from L.A. And we get to LAX and we check in and it's another hour delay. Because the airplanes are coming from the East Coast and they've got to transition in and there's snow and it's a, it's a busy weather day. And so, okay. So we wait for an hour and we get on the plane and we fly in and guess what happens when we land in Denver? We've got to wait 45 more minutes on the runway because some airplane is in our gate and we couldn't even taxi to some other gate and just let us off at midnight and we had to like wait so I'm sitting there going I might as well write my sermon then and get this you know get this patience and prayer thing going because that's how God wants us to mature you know the key is God doesn't want us to be spoiled you know how parents spoil their little kids they buy them so many things trying to please them and in the end you're spoiling your kid rather than patiently letting them learn that they don't get to have everything. God, in a way, says, I'm being patient with you, and I'm teaching you how to grow and mature in your faith. There's a story about a, up high in the Swiss Alps, there's a mountain, or, or a monument, that honors one of the rescue guides. He went out and he was trying to rescue a stranded tourist, and he died. Rescuing the tourists, they both died. And there's a plaque that says, he died climbing. You know, the thought occurs to me, what is our, our goal in life is that we keep climbing. We keep growing. God wants us to mature in our faith. Not to just stop, not to just cash in, win the lotto in faith and go, oh, I'm good, I'm not going to grow. You and me, God, I'm, I'm fine, I'll just go to heaven. God says, I want you to grow up. That's why we look at this measuring tape. That's why we ask God to help us to uh, become, to persevere under pressure to become more sensitive to other people, to be able to manage our mouth, to become a peacemaker, and to be patient and prayerful. God wants us to grow because He delights in us growing. He cheers us on when we take another step forward and we have an opportunity to grow. Next week, we're going to dig right into chapter 1. Consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds. Not too many people call it joy. But God says you can profit from your problems. So we can grow in that. So uh, we'll dig into James. We'll dig into the blueprints. And I'm just going to ask you to hang in there with us so that we can grow in our faith and mature. Will you pray with me this morning? Gracious God, your love for us today is amazing. Although sometimes we're impatient, we know that you still love us. Although we see, God, our insensitivity to those around us, we know that you forgive us and that you walk us in relationship with us. Although we say sometimes that we have hurt people or we have been wounded, God, you continue to forgive. And even though we turn our backs on you sometimes, God, you call us forward and you ask us to have a relationship with Jesus. God, we thank you for this loving grace today, and I thank you for your son, Jesus, who makes this all possible. God, thank you for changing us from the inside out and for helping us grow up, God. I think something that would grieve your heart is if we don't grow, if we just sit stagnant, apathy, who cares? But God, growth is contagious. Encouragement and blessing and being cheered on by those saints around us, God, that is contagious, and we ask you to help us to grow. Lord, we come to you now at the communion table, and we receive from you, God, the bread and the juice, the body broken, the blood poured out, God, that we might have a relationship with you. For anyone who's here this morning and you haven't made a step toward Christ and asked him to come in your life, now is your moment. Right now, you're standing at a crossroads. And you're able to see that God is calling you to a relationship with him. You can turn away from other things that end up failing in the end. God will never fail. Receive God this morning and have a life of change.